So today I want you to meet a guy that I think a lot of you have probably either seen uh, or seen his name in uh, film credits and television credits and uh, and all of that. But he has a really storied career. And uh, and now, in addition to all the work he does, he's getting involved in a really terrific pro police initiative. Lieutenant Bill Erfurth, welcome to the show. Betsy, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great, and I'm so excited that you took the time out to uh, to be with us on the NPA report. So you retired as a lieutenant out of Miami Dade, and you were involved in all kinds of things, from obviously from patrol to uh, eventually to narcotics. You promoted to lieutenant, and uh, so you had this fantastic police career, but also as uh, kind of as a parallel to some of that you got involved in uh um the, the internet and then uh television and film and all kinds of cool stuff so let's tell people about your career so it's kind of a crazy thing you know i started off my career in law enforcement in the chicago area and uh i went down for spring break with some of my college buddies on uh you know just to go to florida like everybody did back in the day and it was, uh, it was actually 1980. And that was the year that uh, in Miami, they had massive riots. Fidel Castro emptied his prisons and insane asylums from Cuba and sent over 350,000 uh, convicts, problem people from Cuba to Miami. And that became the Marielito uh, era and the cocaine cowboy era of the 80s. So when I had gone there on vacation with my friends, City of Miami Police and Metro Dade, it was called Metro Dade instead of Miami Dade Police at the time, were hiring left, right, and center. It was it, they were hiring 2,000 cops over the next uh, two years. And you know, I I know like you and for me. When we, uh, you know, when we first started our careers, you know, there might be one or two positions and a thousand people apply. Well, down there it was thousands of positions and not enough cops and they paid your moving expenses and it was just an amazing time. And of course, my friends were looking at me saying, uh, you better, you better take a job down here, you know, fun and sun on South Beach and all this other kind of stuff. So it was funny that just, you know, the, the recruitment was going on. You'd see billboards on the side of the highways and, and the radio commercials. And so we ended up, we ended up on the beach and, and these, uh, these Metro Dade Marine Patrol cops came by and I thought, that's kind of cool, like working on a boat. And I started talking with them and they said, well, we give the test every, uh, every Thursday. So I, I actually took the test while I was down there on vacation and it was just kind of a fluke. Next thing you know, eight months later, I get I get hired and um, it was certainly a baptism of fire. You know, it was the it was the wild, crazy uh, decade of the 80s known down here as the cocaine cowboy era. Um, the shootings, the homicides were completely off the hook, the drug trafficking. I mean, I, I was like it was literally coming to a, a, a different world for me, for sure. And uh, just a little side note, I mean, there were so many homicides during the 80s that the, uh, the Dade County Medical Examiner's Office had to go to Burger King Corporation that's headquartered in Miami and rent out 18 wheel refrigeration trucks just to store the dead bodies because there were so many murders. And uh, it was just endless, but it, it's, it just kickstarted my career in an amazing way and opened up so many doors with the expansion of the police department and opportunities that I was able to do. I worked uh, undercover dope during that time for a, for a little bit before I got promoted and worked organized crime. And uh, you know, one thing led to the other. I, I had a great career. I was there for 27 years. Uh, I, I uh, you know, the highlights of my career. I was. I was uh, the commander of the tactical narcotics team, which grew to, to some kind of a bit of infamy, quite frankly, and, and got me a lot of exposure. Uh, was used in, you know, emulated in movies and some TV shows and whatnot. But, um, you know, I did that. I was, uh, I was in the fugitive unit. I, I ran violent crime task forces with multi-agencies involved. And 
so all that good stuff, but uh, kind of zoom back into your question and, uh, and whatnot. So all of those real world, real life opportunities kind of opened doors that I had never expected. And I was a bit of, a, of an adrenaline junkie. I loved the wildness of the streets back then. You know, you're young and dumb and all that kind of crazy stuff back in, in those days, right? But uh, I thrived on that and I, and I loved it. So for me, I never thought that these things that I were, was doing would be valuable to, uh, to Hollywood or anything like that. But the first kind of opportunity that kind of came my way was um, a friend of mine, Dennis Collins, was a big radio executive in South Florida, had several radio stations, including one of the talk radio stations there. And he was a really big cop supporter. You know, we kind of called it cuckoo for cops, you know, and he, uh, he came walking in with our, uh, our district, our precinct commander one day, and I was a corporal in uniform still at that time and introduced Dennis and said, Dennis is here to, to do a ride along. And I'm looking out, I'm, I'm standing at the podium, I'm doing roll call and I'm looking out at my, my troops and they're looking at me like, uh, 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 you know, mm. forget that that's not going to be me. So nobody wanted it, you know, nobody wanted this strange guy to, to, you know, ride along for, you know, for apparent reasons. So I said, what the heck, you can ride with me. Well, he rode with me and, and we, we got into an armed robbery in progress and we rolled on a shooting and, you know, some other crazy things that day. It happened to be a busy day just by coincidence. And uh, he had a good time. And, you know, I would say he's probably had probably ridden with me 50 or 60 times over my career after that. And we became fast friends. And um, it was just one of those opportunities that that you look back and say, wow, had I not made that choice, I would have, I would have never had the opportunities. He became one of the, one of my closest friends and still is. But uh, as an executive in the radio business, he started talking to me about, oh, you know, you guys should do a, a, a radio, police radio talk show. And I said, come on, Dennis, I, I don't even know how to turn on a microphone, let alone do all the, he goes, all you need to do is talk. He goes, you have a bit of a gift for gab and you know, and you know your subject matter. So he recruited me after a while, along with another guy, Bill Berger, who was the police chief of North Miami Beach at the time. We ended up working with a couple of other, Greg Zock and Nathan Johnston were both from Metro Dade. They were the producers, Bill Berger and I co-hosted this show. And we started off kind of stumbling through it as a one hour live call-in show once a week. And, um, you know, the, Dennis decided that um, the uh, National Radio Conference was coming up in Orlando and he wanted us to go there and he wanted us to get some exposure. So he introduced us to Dick Clark of American Bandstand, Dick Clark. And Dick Clark listened to some of the radio clips. He heard our our pitch and Dennis's pitch. And the next thing you know, he says, you know, there's never been a police talk show on the radio before this that are, that's hosted by real cops. And he took an interest, hooked us up, got us nationally syndicated. We did that show for nine years and a hundred markets around the United States. And it was, uh, it was kind of crazy. Uh, we just laughed about it. I took a lot of grief about it from the police, you know, from the, from the cops at work, you know, that, you know, how everybody busts your stones constantly about everything. So, uh, but it got us a lot of exposure. And uh, so then, then, you know, I worked my way up the ranks. I became the commander of the tactical narcotics team. We got a lot of exposure with that unit. As a matter of fact, we got nationally recognized in Washington, D.C. as the most proactive police unit in the nation. We were making somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,000 arrests a year. And, uh, and we were just rocking and rolling with that thing. And, and so we got exposure there. And the next thing you know, the Discovery Channel came knocking at the door of uh, our media relations unit. And they wanted to uh, do a mini series about the tactical narcotics team and my unit. So, uh, so we, we went for it. 
And they, uh, they rode along with us for five months, saw everything you could possibly imagine. Half the time I was just rolling my eyes and shaking my head thinking, oh my God, I don't even know how this is going to work, but it worked. And they did this eight part mini series that was very popular. It was called uh, The Real Miami Vice in, uh, in England. It aired on the BBC and then it aired on Discovery here in the States. And so it was very popular, well-received, great ratings. And apparently it caught the notice of Jerry Bruckheimer, who is a big Hollywood producer in uh, Los Angeles. And, you know, one day, Betsy, out of the blue, my phone rings. And, um, you know, I, as a cop, we're all very skeptical. You don't know who's calling you. And I see this unknown number. But I answered it, and uh, so the person on the other line said, hi, this is Roberta from Jerry Buck Bruckheimer's office calling, and I have Jerry on the line. He'd like to speak to you. And I said, who's Jerry Bruckheimer? And she kind of like laughed at me, and she says, well, he's a producer out here in Hollywood. And I go, oh, that's great. I go, well, what does he want to talk to me about? And she says, do you want to take his call or not? And I said, all right, I'll take his call. So I, I, I really didn't know who the guy was. And so I'm on my computer now doing my due diligence and I'm typing in his name and I'm seeing all these big named, you know, CSI. Well, this was right before the CSI Miami started, but, you know, he did that and a bunch of TV shows and movies and whatnot. And so he's a big deal in Hollywood. Big, big, big deal. I, yeah, he's a big deal. I found out he was a big deal. As a matter of fact, I guess he's probably the second biggest producer to Spielberg, right? Yeah. So we're on the phone and he tells me, uh, I, I, got, I got your information. We, we've, we've done our due diligence. We called your police department. Uh, we pulled your personnel file. So he says, we pulled your personnel file. My, my eyebrow almost went over the top of my head. Like, what's this all about? Seriously, you know? And so he says, I'm flying in tomorrow with Michael Bay and we want to have dinner with you. And I said, who's Michael Bay? You know, I mean, I was a cop. I wasn't into all of this TV movie stuff at all. It was never something that I aspired to do. So uh, he starts telling me all these things and he says, yeah, you know, we saw the Discovery Channel. We know you're the commander of the tactical narcotics team. We're, uh, we're considering doing uh, Bad Boys 2. Uh, we'd like you to be involved. We want it to focus and center around your tactical narcotics team. And, uh, and we, we, we need to get together. So I'm, I still can't, I still, am not sure that this is legit. I think this is probably one of my guys playing a prank on me or something, right? That's what I would have thought. And, and yeah. I got to ask you, did you see bad boys one at this point? Yeah, because, you know, I think I had something to do with it. You know, it was it was crazy because even, you know, even uh, Miami Vice, the TV show, when that was going on in the 80s, you know, that was about Metro Dade Police. And we all we all had extra parts in that standing around driving our cars, whatever. So I had done a little bit of that anyway, but just 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 for the extra money more than anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway. We end the phone call. Well, I had asked him, I said, well, when are you flying in? Uh, what airline are you on? Uh, he tells me, well, we're flying private. And I said, oh, are you flying from L.A. to MIA? And he says, no, we're flying from Burbank to MIA, Miami International. And I said, what airline? He goes, oh, it's my own plane. He says, I got a G5 that we're flying in on. So I'm asking these probing questions because now I'm going to call the airport. And I'm going to verify that there's a flight schedule planned and these people are legit, right? So I said, why don't you call me when you guys land? We'll, we'll pick a place on Miami Beach and we'll go to a, a, a you know, nice dinner. So as soon as he hangs up, I call the airport, get the police desk, check it out. Sure enough, there's a flight plan that's registered. Jerry Bruckheimer and Michael Bay, their names are listed. It's a Gulfstream 5 and what, what's he, what he told me. So I go into the office the next day, still unsure, call in a couple of my guys and said, um, we're going to go to dinner tomorrow night because I'm supposed to meet these two guys whose picture I had printed off the internet now. And I said, and if they're not who they say they are, it's going to be their last freaking supper. <laughs> so, so I go to this, the, he calls, 
I meet him at this South Beach restaurant on Miami Beach. I position myself strategically by the bar with my two guns that I've got and my other guys with their MP5s. And um, here comes Jerry walking in. And he walks up and Bill, how's it going? Good, good, good. And he says, Michael's on his way. I'm sitting there having a glass of wine. We order some drinks. Michael shows up. I end up sitting that in that restaurant with the two of them for five hours for dinner. Mm-hmm. And they're picking my brain. We're talking about everything, laughing, carrying on, all kinds of crazy shit with these guys, right? So uh, Jerry says to me, he says, look, I want you to be the technical advisor for the film. And I want the cops to walk, squawk, and talk like cops. And I said, Jerry, if you want them to be that, then why don't you just use real cops? We'll use my people. And he says, can we use your people? I go, you tell me what you want. I'll go to the police department. But, you know, we do a lot of these productions in South Florida. There's a scale, you know, if you want to rent the helicopter, you want to rent the boat, the the motorcycles, whatever you want, you got to pay for it, but we can do that. So I said, yeah, you know, you tell me how many guys you want. You want, want, I go, you want a tank? I'll get you a tank, you know, whatever. So uh, during this whole conversation, Michael looks at me, he goes, I want you to be in the movie. And I go, nah, I don't think so really, because I'll take so much grief over that. And so, you know, like I said, we were there for five hours and a few drinks later, I just relented and said, all right, I'll be in the movie. What the hell? And Jerry says, well, you know, if you're going to be in the movie, we'll make sure you get your SAG card and hook you up and all that kind of stuff, which I had no idea what any of that meant. But I can tell you right now that that movie was whatever, 2001. I still get residual checks from that movie and the other ones and whatnot today and and not just for pennies it's kind of shocking that when you get that sag card that union card you get royalties for as long as that thing plays so i had no idea but they were really going out of their way to hook me up uh, and they appreciated it so we did the movie and the movie was great. They flew me out to, to L.A. for the, you know, the premiere, the whole nine yards. Just some good stuff. But, you know, if you'd have told me 20, 25 years ago that uh, I would be doing this stuff, I'd have looked at you and asked you how much crack you've been smoking because I never had any interest or expectation. But uh... one of the things that I want people to understand you know it, not just cops but our citizens watching especially young people this all started because you were standing there in roll call putting your shift on the street and you know the boss brings in somebody and says all right you know we need somebody to take this ride along and and if you don't you know for people who aren't cops that's one of the things that cops hate is having yeah. to take some citizen who's going to ask a bunch of questions on, on a ride along because we're trying to focus on our job and all that. And so here you were, and I, I think this is such a huge leadership lesson um, that you said, ah, I don't want to stick this guy with, you know, a cop who doesn't want to do it or whatever. I'll take him. Let me take him. And, uh, and that started you on this path to work for this whole parallel Career and open doors that, like you said, you you would have said, man, if, you know, if you thought I was going to be involved in this industry, told me that 30 years ago, right? You would have said you're smoking crack. It's just amazing. But now you're involved in something else in this post-COVID world, um, you know, because of the we're in this post-George Floyd world now, you right. decided to get involved with something uh, uh, with a mutual friend of ours. Um, called Citizens Behind the Badge. Tell people about that. So Citizens Behind the Badge is a brainchild from Craig Floyd, who retired as the chairman of the National Law Enforcement Memorial. And most people in law enforcement certainly know who Craig is. Craig was sitting on the sidelines after being retired, and he couldn't stomach seeing what was going on with the attacks against law enforcement, the defund the police movement and whatnot. And he called me one day. And Craig and I go back because actually when I was talking earlier about CopNet, the the radio show, Craig was a correspondent on the radio show with us. And we had quite a good relationship. Craig called me up and he says, this is the idea that I've got. What do you think? 
would you jump on board with me to do this? And I said, absolutely. I said, who else do you have in mind? Well, coincidentally, he said, well, I was thinking you and Dennis Collins. So that's going back to Dennis Collins that got me involved in doing the radio show. So the three of us are like the three amigos all reunited here. And we've started with Craig's tutelage, this foundation called Citizens Behind the Badge. And we're doing well with this. I mean, it's really taken off and he's using all of his connections and uh, whatnot from his 30 years at the National Law Enforcement Memorial. So the outreach and the success so far has been tremendous. It absolutely is. And I, I'm uh, so pleased to be a little bit, little tiny piece of it as a board member. Um, Bill, where can people find out more information about you? Of course, they could just Google you and uh, Citizens Behind the Badge. Well, nobody cares to find out any more about me. I'm a, I'm a has-been now, right? That was all water under the bridge. But nonetheless, I mean, it's, it's really important, uh, our, our foundation, Citizens Behind the Badge. So uh, we have social media presence and we have our website and whatnot. And you know what? We've, we've got over 10 million mailers going out to the public this year. But uh, the website, they can anybody can go to the website and find out more. It's uh, behindbadge.org, and uh, we have uh, a Citizens Behind the Badge Facebook page, as well as LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, the whole gamut of social media. It's easy to find us. Absolutely. Bill, I knew you'd be a fantastic interview. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. And if you would like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. Put the gun down! Put the gun down! Ah. Last year, law enforcement officers were involved in hundreds of thousands of use of force incidents. A use of force incident is when an officer must use nonverbal tactics to gain control of a dangerous situation. Put the knife on the ground. In many cases, officers have no choice but to use force when a suspect doesn't comply with a lawful order. Use of force is always ugly. No one likes it, especially police officers. Together, we can help de-escalate these dangerous encounters. Help police officers by complying with their lawful orders. Don't attack, attempt to disarm, or flee from an officer. Use of force is an officer's last option. Most incidents can be avoided by not resisting arrest. If you feel you've been wrongfully detained by a police officer, then seek a legal solution after the encounter has been resolved. Let's keep everyone safe. Comply now and complain later.